7 p.m. here on Wednesday night, Watershed Church of Christ. We welcome all of you who joined us for Bible study. That's a good reminder for us all to uh, silence your cell phones, including myself. Listen, if, if they pick on you too much, we'll just throw them out of the class. I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and take both of you carry me out. Yeah, we would. <laughs> The earliest he's ever been like. Yeah, the earliest he's ever been. He's probably helping you. I just can't believe Jerry can tell time. <laughs> well, I uh, had a conversation today with um, Keith Brack. I know that he emailed some stuff to the office as well. Um, his brother Stephen passed away uh, back on Monday, uh, shortly after being taken off of life support. A very painful situation for, for Keith, for that entire family. Um, there will be a private family service at the Veterans Cemetery uh, for Stephen. And so keep uh, Keith and, of course, that entire family in your prayers as they continue to deal with a very tough uh, moment in their life as a family and uh, for his friends and others that have been connected with Stephen. I uh, know that Jim Preston and Buddy and Shoney, they they all have relationships uh, with Stephen and also asked to uh, see Rocky and Crystal in our chat tonight. Uh, continue to keep them in your prayers and know that they're still going through a difficult time. Other losses, Laura Hinton, a tragic loss of her cousin, Darlin's son, Chase. And then, of course, Marilyn Hovis and family in the passing of Don Hovis back on January 25th. Just real quickly, any uh, updates that we have. Ronnie Hunt is back in St. Luke's Hospital with fever uh, caused by the chemotherapy that was given to us back on Monday. Bonnie Green, you may have saw uh, Brother Green here with us on Sunday. And if you spoke to him, you knew that Miss Bonnie wasn't feeling good at all. Um, she's dealing with uh, neuropathy in her feet, but she also was just having some other symptoms they're trying to to diagnose and they're testing her for fibromyalgia linda ohm had a fall uh back on saturday but praise god there were no breaks she is having a pacemaker replacement uh today uh arabella salvador uh, Fell at school and lacerated a kidney. Wow. <clears throat> and is home after a stay in Texas, Texas Children's Hospital. Uh, we'll have very limited activity for a while, as you can imagine, after that. Carol Watson, I uh, know Kevin's not able to be with us tonight, and uh, Carol <laughs> is having pain in her shoulder, and this was given to us back on Monday. She was having x rays, but don't know the result on those x-rays. Steven Smith uh, was having uh, hip surgery, right? Hip surgery. Uh, he's home from the hospital doing much better. All right. Any uh any new updates that you have here tonight or anything online that we need to add to our prayer list? Can we pray for the people in the panel? Crystal's friend that we visited with last year. He uh, is a youth minister there, our music minister there in the, in the town that we were in said that several of their members have lost everything they've had. 
between French and Canadian, which is, he said it's about 35 minutes north of where they are. And that one of their rancher friend members has lost his herd of cattle, which was over 400 head. So there's a lot of damage up there. Lost. Plus, Carl has got relatives and right. same and family 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 family. Family that way. Last I heard from my cousin in Emerald, there's a million acres that have right. burned in the panhandle. Yeah. Yeah, 850,000 acres is what I last saw the estimation at. They even evacuated a couple of cities and a government facility outside of there. Well, you mentioned Fridge. I know the ministry team there at Fridge, and uh, they're they're doing okay. They've had members that have been affected. So y'all both had the same one. Others. And Lena's girlfriend, uh, Kathy. Uh, Donahue, her husband, uh, Donnie Donahue, we found out this week, Kathy called and talked to Edwina for the longest time, that uh, he now has bone cancer, mm -hmm. and they don't know to what extent, honey, is that right? Yeah. <clears throat> He's back in Mobile. Or in Sarah Land. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, my son Brett. Well, there he had a little procedure today to repair a tear. So just for healing. Say that one more time. He had like a little uh, day surgery today to repair a tear. You know what I'm saying? In his knee. No, not his knee. Not me. Another play. Okay. Just, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it that way then. I just make sure I wouldn't miss it something. No, no. And then Bobby Thompson put on the, put on here, pray for her daughter in law, Kim Thompson, who lost her mother on Monday. Um, Jennifer had a colonoscopy today. It's been a busy day for us. And um, they found four uh, polyps um, in this area where her cancer was located. Um, they're not sure if those are due to the radiation and the effects of the radiation. And then they found a, a larger polyp uh, elsewhere. They've all been uh, cut and sent off for biopsy. So we'll know that answer that in two weeks as to the status of those. But tough night last night. Anybody that's going through a colonoscopy, you you know quite well that the preparation is, yeah, yeah. But she's sleeping at home right now. And uh, also Billy, we're not sure he's been sick now for about a week and a half, running a, a fever or ninety nine. Uh, and uh, just feeling lousy. So we've had two doctor's appointments trying to figure it out. We thought it may be mono, but it wasn't mono. Um, so we're still trying to figure out what's going on with him. But he's not feeling well at all. He, if you can tell when Billy's sick, when he doesn't want to do anything but just lay in the bed. He's not that kind of kid. Uh, he just will not not his normal energetic self. Anybody else? All right, let's begin in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to you for the love and the grace and your mercy that gives us the strength and the ability to continue to live each day, Father, putting one foot in front of the other, navigating the course of this life with the various uphill challenges, the moments where we face struggle or sickness, or rejoicing those moments when things are, are going our way. We know that all things are from you. 
Father, we're grateful for the immense blessings that you shower down upon us daily, regardless of how our day may be going, Father. There are so many blessings to be counted. So, Father, we wanted to begin our prayer tonight by giving you the thanks for everything that you provide for us, you sustain us, and we know we could not be here tonight without you, Father. So we give you the glory for allowing us to come together and spend this time together in fellowship and study of your word. Father, we want to share these uh, tonight that are on our hearts in this prayer list. First, with those who've lost loved ones. Tonight, we ask that you would be with Keith Brack and the loss of his brother, Stephen, and that entire family. For Rocky and Crystal, the loss of Sally. Ask you to be with Laura Hinton, the loss of her uh, cousin Darla and son Chase. For the Hobis family, the loss of Dunn. We ask that you would continue to be with all those who are facing uh, lengthy hospital stays, especially right now, our, our brother Ronnie Hunt, who's back at St. Luke's. And not only father dealing with cancer, but dealing with the effects of the chemotherapy, which can often be very severe. We ask that you'd continue to be with those who are recuperating or those who are dealing with illness. Erna Bash, Norma Carter, Gary Clark and Gloria Dennis, Melba Doss, Lyndon Dutton and Blas Gomez and Bonnie Green, and Sherry Green, and Gene Haas and Cookie Hawthorne, Barbara Hazel, and Leslie Hoffman, Jerry and Pam Jones, Rick Ludwig and Sally Mimes, Linda Ohm and Kathy Parker, for the entire Reinhardt family, Sandra Rowland and Doug Rutledge, and Manuel Salinas and the entire Salinas family, for Arabella, Arabella Salvador, for Nancy Stover and family, for Sam Swope and Edwina Thompson, for Rosa Villarreal and family, for Mike Borden Baum, for Carol Watson and be with Kevin as well as he ministers to her. For Bob and Charlene York. Father, we also pray for all of our homebound members. Father, we pray that in some way we can be an encouragement to them, reach out to them, pay them a visit, let them know that they are still very much a part of our church family and we love them and hope, Father, that that they feel that desire from us and, and our love for them. We also pray for all of our family and friends, whether it be Judith Brack or, or Dora Livingston, our Beverly Demo, or Raymond Lee Matthews or Stephen Smith, for Edwina's friend uh, and her husband, Donnie Donahue and the bone cancer, for Brett Taylor and for Kim Thompson, the passing of her mother. Father, there are unspoken prayer requests at this time, and just ask, Father, that you would see into our hearts and those needs, and that you would operate, Father, as only you can do, with your power and strength, your ability to rectify even the most difficult situations of life that we may face. We ask you to be with us now as we enter in this time of study, be with Cliff and I, that we may be able to recall accurately from your word and things that we've studied so that we could all benefit from a further gaining of your truth and knowledge of how to exist as your church here on this earth. Father, be with us as we go about this week. Help us to be a shining light in the community around us, whether it be in our workplace, our schools, or even within our home. Father, we pray that Christ's light would be shining wherever we may be this week. Father, forgive us of our sins, the many trespasses that come because of our sins of commission or omission. We know that, Father, there are things that we ought to be doing that we're not doing and things that we should not do, that our flesh and the weakness of it makes the choices to do. So, Father, we're grateful for the blood of Jesus Christ. That cleanses us of all iniquity. Pray, Father, that we would always be grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus. It's through his name that we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>
do a review. All right, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 1 and ending in verse 4, that is the section that we are going to do our very best to wrap up tonight. And then we'll move on to verse 5 uh, next week, Lord willing. Romans 14, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls. He will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. Well, uh, Cliff and I began this section last week just by way of review. Let us go over just a few things with you. First of all, this is a lengthy session, uh, section, excuse me. That'll take us here from the beginning of chapter 14 all the way through Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And the section here is dealing with matters of Christian liberty along with matters of conscience. And certainly we started to see a little bit of that play out uh, last Wednesday night. Verses 1 through 4, as we have seen, revolves around foods that are no longer prohibited by Old Testament dietary laws. Verse 5 and following, we're going to deal with the subject of days or festivals or holy days and and not celebrating certain days that were formerly required under the Old Testament law. And then the third and final section, beginning in verse 13, is going to deal more practically with various issues of conscience that have to do uh, with days, eating, and, and drinking. Um, we have two groups of people here. Does anybody remember what those two groups of people are and how they are described? Not their... Uh, not their race, but what are they described here as? The stronger and weaker brother. And wow, it, it was really interesting. You know, last week Cliff gave us the definition of the word weak, and it means sickly. In fact, most of the time, whenever you see this word translated, this word sick in the New Testament, it usually means somebody who is physically ill. And sick, uh, someone that is so diseased that they're left weak and just unable to truly uh, carry about their normal activity. But Paul's not talking about physical weakness here, is he? He's not talking about physical weakness. He's talking about spiritual weakness. Um, and then we, we talked about how inside the body of Christ, as verse one talks about, we have those individuals who are weak in faith and others who are strong in faith. And when he says uh, faith, it's better. Uh, in fact, some of your translations will actually show this. It's better the phrase is in the faith, because we're not talking about uh, here a subjective faith. We're talking about the objective faith that has to do with the doctrine of Jesus Christ, uh, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints as Jude 3 talks about. Um, so we're talking about in the faith. These brothers are weak or strong in the faith. In other words, in this matter of doctrine, they lack proper understanding of what is permitted and what is not pro prohibited uh, in or his or her new life in Jesus Christ. Now, Cliff, what did it tell us that we're supposed to do if you are the stronger brother? What are you supposed to do with the one who is weak in faith? You must accept that one, brother, that is weak in the faith. In other words, folks, you welcome that individual. You don't shun him because of opinionated matters. You don't kind of hold him at arm's length. You don't belittle that individual. I've seen that done, and that is a, a shame. I've also seen people literally make fun. Well, you don't have the knowledge I do. You don't make fun of, of, of them. You don't mock them. You don't mock them. Why? 
Why don't want you do me a thing? Do what, Jerry? Because we want them to be just like us. Want them to be just like us. Whatever but, we believe. Well, that's, that's true. what we want them to do. But, 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 but why, why should we not want to belittle someone? Why should we not want to mock someone? Why should we not want to shun someone because of opinionated matters? We so must be wrong ourselves. Well, we may be wrong ourselves. That's true. What, Sam? Because uh, we're supposed to love them. That we're supposed to love them. That's, that's what I've been looking for. Because that's exactly what Paul had been dealing with all the way up to this point. We're supposed to show that love. How can you show that love if that is your attitude towards somebody else whose opinion is different than what your opinion or opinionated matter? And, and it's really cool because everything that we had studied from chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 9, going through verse 21, then chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, all that speaking that Paul has done to the church about Christian love, I and mean, that carries right over uh, here into chapter 14. And so, um, it, it's it's interesting. You said opinions, and, and that's the actual word that in the New American Standard, it says for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. And what did we say last week, Alan? What about opinions? Everybody what has one, just like what? Just like belly buttons, right? Uh, and he, he says, when he's talking about um, this uh, brother, this weaker brother, he didn't say, uh, anything he said opinions that they're not rooted and grounded in scripture and I think that word opinion is is very interesting because it actually comes from the word the idea of dialoguing in other words here is the weaker brother and his mind uh, there is something in front of him that is really bothering his conscience and he is dialoguing with himself should I or shouldn't I and he may know the truth. He may know that God has made all things clean, but here stands in front of him something that goes against everything that he's been taught since he was very, very little uh, from generation to generation. And he's going, you know, I, I know this is what the word says, but this, uh, wow, it's, it's so much that, that I can't go against my conscience in this moment. Now, the other brothers over here going, well, I got the truth. Truth is, God's made all things clean. And, and it'd be very easy for that stronger brother to then hold that weaker brother in a, a sense of judgment. And that's really, you know, what what this is, uh, this first section is, is really all about. Um, I love this statement here, Cliff, where he talks about he eats vegetables only. Well, he is so... I guess you could say zoned in. Uh, in other words, he is so strict. He's so narrow minded that he won't even eat the meat that was allowed. You know, there is meat that was allowed to eat under the Old Testament dietary laws. And he won't even do that. He'll just strictly eat vegetable. Now, we found it interesting, Be, and we want to bring it to your uh, uh, attention that the word only, is it in your translation? Will only eat vegetables? Is it, who has that in their translation? That it was, Jerry's got it, in, you got it? Only eat, Charles got it. Only is not in the original. Only is not in the original. It was supplied by the translators that was translating that particular uh, translation. So it could actually be that he eats meat, <clears throat> that all the meats that were permitted under the Old Testament law, but primarily he eats vegetables. And it could be they didn't have access to some of the meats that were That's available. Right. That's right. So it's just something for you to consider here. But the word only is not in the original. And when he's speaking of original, he's talking about the original manuscripts that, that a lot of these texts the were pulled from. Yeah. Um, how many of you have done your, your daily Bible readings? How many of you have gotten through uh, the end of the Leviticus readings? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's been coming to me, hit me up about it and going, Jonathan, this is this is. Uh, some people said it's repetitive. Some people said 
it's kind of gross. Well, if you look at Leviticus chapter 11, uh, you're going to see certain restrictions. And when you read those things, you might think, well, man, I don't see any reason for this. But trust me when I tell you that God has a reason. God always has a reason. And and in this case, the, the lesson, the object lesson that we started to talk about last Wednesday night was that there needs to be uh, this separation in your life between you and the world. That was the case for the Jews. There needed to be that object lesson in their life that um, really separated them. And Leviticus chapter 11, 44 and 45, we talked about how that's repeated in 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 and 16. You shall be holy for I am holy. Thus says the Lord. And that verse comes at the end of Leviticus chapter 11 after God has told you this, this laundry list of which animals you can or cannot eat and so forth. And so he goes through this whole thing and you read it all. If you've been doing your daily Bible reading, you think, why on earth would God do this? There's a whole chapter on this. And I have to admit, I got a lot of questions about some of the things that I've, I've read in Leviticus, still do. And uh, I don't imagine I'll ever ask God about it. I don't imagine that'll be very much on my bucket list of important things to talk about in heaven, but it's still a, a pretty interesting uh, conversation. And Cliff and I were talking about there were certain hygienic benefits to some of the things that you have to acknowledge. Um, also, uh, Deuteronomy 14, after Moses uh, gives the law the second time, uh, that object lesson about uh, being separate uh, and being holy is, is something that uh, is repeated there. And then uh, Acts chapter 10. Um, this all really stems from the fact that in Acts chapter 10, Peter receives a vision. And uh, we talked about that sheet that was let down from heaven. And there are clean and unclean animals on it by the standards of Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. And Peter says, what you say? You know, this ain't going to work for me, right? This I can't eat what's unclean. And what does the angel tell him? God has made it all clean. So now you can eat any of these things. And that's the background that gets us kind of to where we're at here with this church in Rome. Um, and, and Cliff, why don't you repeat what we talked about last week about, you know, the fact that Paul didn't come out and just say, hey, you Jews and hey, you Gentiles. You know, he had been since the beginning of the whole book of Rome. If you go back to the very first of the book of Romans and come all the way through, Paul was trying to level the playing field because you have Jews and then you have the Gentiles. And the Jews, by just the fact that they have the inheritance of the Old Testament, they have the old law, they have they have all of this stuff, they thought of themselves better than what the, the Gentiles did. So Paul had been basically leveling the playing field because he, he wound up by saying all men as sin and falling <coughs> short of the glory of God. All men included the Jews and the Gentiles. So if he would have distinguished between the Gentile brothers and the Jewish brothers, that would have basically torn down everything that he built up to to that point. Although, you know, regarding the strong and the weak, I think Paul had a very good reason not to mention the identity of the strong and, and weak and just called them out that way. And it, to me, it's fairly evident that to both the original reader as well as us today, the strong believers, those were primarily the Gentiles. Why would they be considered the strong? Well, they were not, they did not have over them the old law. They did not have over their heads all of the restrictions of the eating of the old law. So eating of meat eating of the vegetables, okay, there, there, there is no big deal. So to, to them, the Gentiles, they would have been stronger. I used this analogy last time. I invite y'all over to the house. I'm going to cook catfish. To the Gentiles, all right. Where are the tar sauce? But to the Jews, oh, 
Now I have just driven a wedge between two different people because of something that I had no idea that was bad. On the other hand, you have now the weak, which is the Gentiles. They have all of these hangups coming off of them from Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 14. But the whole. You mean the Jews? Uh, the, the Jews, I mean, thank you. So they are in the. Here we are, the Gentiles in the, in the Roman Empire. They're a long way from Jerusalem, and now they have been converted. All the Jews have. And now through the preaching of the, the gospel, they're told everything is clean. They don't have this specific hang up anymore. They don't have these dietary laws any, anymore. In their mind, they're free to eat anything. But, folks, can you see the battle that's going on inside of their, I guess you could say, inside of their soul trying to reason out? Because all their life, they've been told this is clean, this is unclean. But Jesus now says all things is clean. Don't bless you first, thank you. Make it clean and make blessing. No, it's already been made. It's clean. already been made clean by God. You're blessing. You're just giving thanks. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. You're not. You're not blessing it, though. It, it, that's a misnomer. You're not blessing the food. The food is already made clean. You're giving thanks for that food. That's we we call it blessing, but it's kind of a blessing and thank you. It's a different. It's a different thought process than 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 this. It's a totally different concept. Nothing that we eat do we have to to ask God to make it blessed or make it holy or to make it clean. It's probably a good idea to bless them to use it to our nourishment and for our good health. That's a that's a very good principle. But to say that we have to bless it in the sense of God has to do something supernatural to that food to make it uh, holy or blessed. Is, is I don't know. Am I am I right on that, guys? I've never heard that that I have to do that, I, and I've studied God's word most of my life. But I've heard people say that, but I've never found that in, in my Bible. It says I have to do that. You're giving God thanks for receiving of the blessing of, of the, the, the food. And and I think that may be where people come up with, let's say, the blessing. blessing. Yeah. And I think it doesn't say that anything that we give thanks for is consecrated by God. So That's right. receive it with thanksgiving in your heart is consecrated by God. That's right. So you can eat a rat or you can eat a caterpillar. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we use the phrase, bless it to our, bless it to our bodies. That's right. And that, by way of wording, that means... Use it for our goodness, right? Mm -hmm. I sometimes pray that it won't make me sick. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got Crohn's disease like I do, you say a prayer that this goes down the right way and does what it needs to do. Hope they're not too much spices. Yeah, yeah. especially if I eat crawfish because I know it needs some help. <laughs> um, you know, you, you've really hit on it, so I don't want to go back over it again, but I, I think it's interesting that, that Paul would write this much about food. Doesn't that tell you something about the first century church? They were spending a lot of time together, meals and fellowship, and, and these things could have been very big hiccups to their fellowship. Um, and, and like you talked about, you know, these, these Jewish believers who have been raised as Hebrews and they have been raised under that Old Testament Mosaic law and they've been raised not eating certain animals and fish and birds and now all of a sudden uh in the lord's church they're over somebody's house or they're having dinner as as the church family and uh gentile brothers bring out these things that were forbidden in the old testament i mean you can just imagine a jewish brother in christ the shock on their face i mean we don't realize it but they they couldn't even look at these things they couldn't even look at it it, it, it felt like it made them unclean just to look upon or to witness others eat these things. It was disdainful for them. And so, class, we're talking about the larger context here. These Jewish believers still need instruction and training in righteousness. They need to know what's in the truth, and they need to, over time, begin to accept that the Christian faith, those dietary laws have been annulled, that, you know, 
the cross of Jesus Christ, all those ceremonial laws, what happened to them? They were done away with, right? But you can imagine they were taught all through there, if you do these things, God will bless you. If you do these things, you will be accursed. Yeah. And so they're thinking, my goodness, we cannot go and do the things we've been commanded for thousands of years. Now it's okay to do it? Yeah, it's like people, I think sometimes, Mike, that we have this sense of belief that a Jew would go down the water of baptism and come out no longer a Jew. It just didn't work that way. There was a lot of training, a lot of time that had to take place uh, in their learning and their growth to maybe discard some. I don't think most Jews that I study about, that they had a hard time with it. Uh, Peter had a hard time with it. Paul had a hard time with it. Another example of modern day is, you know, I, I was brought up in the Catholic Church and praying to Mary to put in a good word with Jesus because that's his mother. He'll listen to his mother before he'll listen to you. There's nothing biblical about that. No. But if you're raised that way and you're praying to Mary every day faithfully, well, then you come to realize what the word says. Nowhere are we told to pray to another human being other than Jesus, our one mediator. But you can understand that if a person was raised that way, they've got to reprogram. Reprogram. Mm -hmm. That's right. And Mike, if not only that, think about somebody who was out in the world, living in the world all their life, thinking about something that is right, come to the understanding of the truth. And now there is a completely rethought process, even to this day. Well, the fact class, if you really think about it, those things that were called unclean, inherently, they were not unclean anyway. Because God chose them to be unclean. And he did that so to make a point. That there are certain things I don't want you touching in this world. Kind of already started in the garden, right? Yeah, yeah. I there was a, uh, everything was clean except for one thing. And they touched it. Yeah, didn't just touch it. Man. Well, they did. No, they did. <laughs> All right. Now that Christ has died on the cross and rose from the grave, the object lesson is removed. Okay. <laughs> And that's why also we're not bringing a lamb to the sacrifice in our worship service today. I can just see Jonathan up there on the pool, on the pulpit and somebody bringing a lamb down the center aisle. I don't know how you see me do that. <laughs> and that's why there's not an Old Testament priest. All those things, folks, have been fulfilled. Every single one of them has been fulfilled on the cross. All right, let's keep plowing ahead now. Let's move on to verse number three. Our next principle, we're going to be talking about attitudes. Specifically here, an attitude that you should guard against. Paul's going to issue a warning concerning attitudes of both groups here, both the stronger and the weaker brother. And he starts out in verse three, what does he say? He says, the one who eats. And the implication being the one who eats what? Anything, all things, right? Let me make this clear here. Paul is speaking of the stronger brother here at the beginning of verse 3. He is the one who can eat all things, right? And that stronger brother is what? Not to regard with contempt. Now, when you regard with contempt to someone, what are you doing? Judging do what? You're judging him. You're judging him. Yeah. The one who does not eat. So the one who does not eat would be the weaker brother here. And the one who does not eat is that weaker brother. And unfortunately, the weaker brother is still bound by his conscience against those things that are no longer regulative in the Christian life. I actually heard a brother one time say, it was on the news. They were talking about finding some lost Dead Sea Scrolls. And he said, now my faith is completely shattered. I don't know what to believe. Well, that's a person that's weak in the faith. They can't find anything on this earth that should shake a strong Christian's faith. It's in Christ crucified. That's our faith. It's not in anything that you might discover or find somewhere. It's in the fact of the reality of Christ. God coming to earth and dying for our sins. And our faith is in that and that alone. And that's what unifies us. Even if we can't come to agreement on everything in the book. 
we agree that Jesus is the Christ, and, what, and this is his word, and we agree with it and go along with it because it, he's our master, which kind of leads into that verse four about right. yeah, so you can judge your I mean, the fact is, again, let me make sure you understand that, that it was doctrine that under Christ, man was free to eat all things. When when Paul, uh, you know, is saying these things here, he understands and we understand that Christ has made all things clean. And yet here's a Jew, the weaker brother, as it's alluded to here, who says, you know, I hear it. But I just can't do it. Maybe this is too much too soon or it bothers my conscience to go against what I've heard and learned and practiced my whole life. And yet still, yet still, the warning Paul gives here is that the stronger brother is not to regard the con with contempt the weaker brother. Yeah, I think I think, though, we need to point out that what's our flesh going to press us to do in that moment? If we know somebody has a hang up in a, in a section of the word of God and we've got the answer to it, what do we think our job is to do? We got to set them straight. You think you can. You need to get your mind right, buddy. You're not trusting in God. And his, don't you know that God has said, you know, we could beat them over the head with it. Right. But is that what Paul tells people in the church to do? No. You rebuke your brother gently. And in, love. and in love let's look back again at this word contempt here in verse 3 we've already looked at part of it but it really means we should not ridicule him should not put him down have you ever seen people mock somebody because well I know it and maybe you don't know it or belittle him because well you've been in the church this long and you still don't understand that should not speak of him or or to him in a in a completely dismissive way. I don't want to waste my time with you. That is terms of the overall truth, folks. This is not an issue that's worth destroying a brother over. It's not an issue worth driving a a, a complete wedge into a congregation over, over. especially. Dividing the body of Christ over. I've told you this before. Edwina and I attended one church that because of where the Lord's Supper was in the particular order of worship, you had two separate sides of the congregation. And whenever the amen was said, this part of the congregation got up, went to the side, and out that door. And this part of the congregation got up to the side and out that door. The two never crossed the aisle. Remember, folks, as Paul will say in verse number 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. And a lot of people, they make it that. Now Paul's going to address the, <laughs> the weaker brother. So he's already addressed the, the stronger brother. Now he's going to address the weaker brother. And basically, for lack of better words, he's going to say, hey, listen, up. this is a two way street, right? Not just a one way street. It's a two way street. It's not just that the stronger brother shouldn't look down on the weaker brother. No, the weaker brother should not have a judgmental spirit toward the stronger brother. Now, it's interesting because we often and I even we talk about contempt and judgment. But Paul uses two different words here. He uses contempt with the stronger brother to the weaker brother, and he uses judgment with the weaker brother to the stronger brother. I, I, I don't know the exact reason for that, but I do find it interesting. Probably because the Jews were judging them according to the law. Yeah, that would that well, would make sense, wouldn't it? Measuring you against it and saying, if you don't measure up, because the law says this. The, the, the law was handled on the cross, and they're having a hard time with that. Yes, it was. The, the weaker brother should not have a judgmental spirit towards the stronger brother because that stronger brother feels that he has the freedom to eat and drink certain things. Um, so I want you to notice what he says in the middle of verse three. He says, and the one who does not eat, 
Now, certainly we know that does not mean that he just starves to death, right? No, it, it means he will not eat those things that were once forbidden in the past under the Mosaic law. That person is not to judge the one who eats. The one who eats, again, is the stronger brother because he's exercising his liberty in Christ to eat all things. In this case, though, the weaker brother is not to judge. You could come up with any different ways of putting this, but again, he's not to criticize him, put him down. You go through any laundry list of things uh, in re referring to the stronger brother. Jonathan, I really think that this is as good a time as any, folks, for us to be reminded that this was all written under the context of Christian love. You got to remember that Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Now Romans 14, three is the, I guess you could say the actual fleshing out of what was said back in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. In other words, I need to give preferential treatment to my weaker or, or I don't need to give them. They, above all, I don't need to do anything that is divisive. Do I? Do I need to be divisive if somebody of, a, of opinionated matters has a different idea of, of me? I need to give preference to my weaker or stronger brother. And above all, I don't need to make this a divisive issue, whatever it is. I see this in our churches all the time where we tend to group up in the party lines. We, we find these things that we agree on and find these things that we disagree on. And we kind of clump ourselves and give preferential treatment to those we agree with and just kind of hold at bay or distance those that we don't agree with. And that was going on right here in this Roman church. Paul wouldn't have written about it if it wasn't happening. Okay. And then, you know, you mentioned chapter 12, chapter 13, verse eight, Paul says, Oh, nothing to anyone except one. Love one another for what was it for the one who loves his neighbor. So fulfilled the law, right? Also, Romans 13, 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Chapter 14 as well. You go all the way, as we mentioned, chapter 15, around verse 13. I mean, we're just really getting into the weeds here. Where it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. Eating or not eating. Doesn't matter. You need to show love towards that other person who is at a different place this moment in time in their faith and in their Christian walk. So, folks, this leads now to the final principle that Jonathan and I want to share with you. And it's the idea of giving approval. This begins at the end of verse three. In class, it includes all of chapter four. And here we're going to, I guess, learn why mutual criticism from either side is really out of place. Because Paul says at the end of verse 3, what? What did he say at the end of verse 3? What, what has God done? God has received them both. God has accepted them. Now, this class is actually addressed to what? The weaker brother. Although it applies also to the stronger brother as well, doesn't it? But in fair to the context here, it's actually directed to the weaker brother. And so in verse 4, 
that you should accept the stronger brother in his exercise of Christian liberty. You should accept him. Why? Because God has what? Accepted him. God accepted the uh, Abel, the old Cain sacrifice. That's right there. One of the vegetarian and the other raised animal. That's way back there in Genesis, back verse chapter 6. So, it applies equally to the stronger brother. You should accept the weaker brother. Why? Yeah, the Jew, they were the weaker brother. Mm -hmm. The Jews was the weaker brother. And you are to accept him because God has already accepted him. But the Jew, the, the Gentile, Gentile the weaker brother. In their eyes. Yes. Then, then they had what was the Judaizers that went along and started preaching the circumcision. They were still trying to hold on to that old law and old practice. And uh, over in Colossians, he says, The circumcision not made with hands. <clears throat> we're all one in Christ Jesus. We've been baptized into Christ Jesus. So it, it just makes the point again. Yeah, you know, I have a feeling that as much emphasis as Paul places on the weaker brother and, and the admonitions that he gives the weaker brother, that it might be the case that the Jews were being far more judgmental against the Gentiles than the Gentiles were against the Jews. If you just flesh it out for the amount of emphasis here, it would lead you to believe that uh, even though the Jews were really the weaker brother, they uh, they were holding their uh, stronger brother in, in contempt quite a bit. Well, in Acts, over that chapter where they had their big council in the room, they wanted three things applied to the Gentiles coming in. Restrain from eating things. Nothing strain. Nothing strain on the blood. Three things. Yeah, there, there was, it had to do with uh, sexual immorality. I know it was one of them, but I don't, I don't. Things, yeah. Blood. Anything strangled to sexual immorality. Those three things. Well, well, you know, well, what did he say? Why should we levy on the Gentile laws and regulations that we ourselves cannot follow? Right. Right. Things offered to idols from the world strangled to sexual immorality. All right, verse four, Paul says, Who are you to judge the servant? of another again this is directed toward the weaker brother in other words who are you the weaker brother to judge the servant that's the stronger brother of another and another refers to whom who is the another here servant of another who's the another there you go the lord who are you to judge who are you to criticize this is really a rhetorical question, is it not? In other words, he's saying, you're not the judge. So you don't get to walk around with your nose up in the air. <laughs> and, I, and I do believe it should be noted, folks, here, that Paul's instructions mainly focus upon the weaker brother, not the stronger brother. Here it is, the weaker brother who needs the most help. It is the weaker brother who is most easily offended. Why? Because he's actually narrowed than the truth. It's the weaker brother who has the most problems with the matter of Christian liberty, not the stronger brother. Now, uh, can a stronger brother have problems with Christian liberty? Sure. How? By going what? By going too far, right? You've got the stronger brother who can have problems with Christian liberty by going too far and abusing the liberty that he has in Jesus Christ. He can have problems on the other end of that spectrum, right? But as Cliff has kind of pointed out here, again, this weaker brother is very easily offended in this matter. He's not able to truly understand this Christian liberty. And he's watching another brother in the church do things that are against his conscience. 
there's a saying, you can do things right in the wrong manner. Right. Mm -hmm. You can eat the meat, but it's the wrong manner to do so. If you do it knowing you're offending your weaker brother who's now going to fall away from the Lord and from the body of Christ because it's so offensive to him. And it's because of his weakness, his spiritual weakness, that he does it. But that's why the Lord says, yeah, you're stronger. But don't use your strength and freedom to do it when you know he's weaker. You can still eat it. Don't do it in his presence. And I use that with alcohol. I, you know, there's no commandments. It says, Thou shalt not drink alcohol in the New Testament. Right. But you know, there are people who are weaker. And you've got the freedom to do it. But if you do it, and a weaker brother or sister sees you do it, and they do it, and they're weaker, it could end up shipwrecking their life. Now, are you responsible for other people? Well, yeah. yes, I, I believe we do have that. We've got a, a level of influence, and we're to use it to glorify God. So is everything we're doing to God's glory, or is some of it my selfish, what I want? And that's where we have to just examine ourselves. I think you'd be honest with ourselves. You can do it. You've got freedom to do it. I don't think you can ever be drunk and be right in God's eyes. Drunkenness is condemned at all times. Anything in excess. And anything in excess, actually. That's right. So let's continue here in verse 4 where Paul says to his own master he stands or falls. Now that's referring to the stronger brother. In other words, Paul saying the one who is stronger in the faith will stand or fall before his own master. And class, this word master here is kurios which is also the same word, Greek word translated as Lord. And it is a reference by way of analogy to Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the stronger brother, brother will stand or fall not to you, but to the Lord himself. As Paul says, for the Lord is able to make him stand. You know, you know really, uh, as we tie this up and close this up tonight. What Paul is saying to this group of brothers and sisters in the church at Rome is that you guys are becoming entangled over these issues of eating and drinking and holidays. You're majoring in the minors. Stop it. Accept one another in Christian love. Yes, there are weaker brothers. Yes, there are stronger brothers, but you need to have Christian love for people in your church that are at a different place in, in their faith at this point in time. Stop holding them in contempt and stop judging them because here's what it really boils down to. Paul is saying, if you hold your brother in Christ in contempt, guess what? God's going to hold you in contempt. If you criticize your brother because of these issues, the Lord's going to bring criticism upon you. And, it, it, and so the idea is, you know, the book, I don't know if a better way to say this, but sometimes you just got to back off and give people room to grow. You know, when you we read these things and they seem a little abstract to us, we're trying to put ourselves in the place of what was important to these people 2,000 years ago. But we all know that Satan's playbook hasn't changed. Right. If you look at the church today, um, what are we doing? What do we get caught up in? It's exactly the same thing. It just doesn't have anything to do with meat and vegetables. It has to do with, gee, that, that church down the street doesn't believe in uh, giving the money to missionaries right. or helping orphans homes. Those, and then we're, you know, we're, we're pointing fingers back and forth at each other over things just exactly like this. And you, you study the just in the Lord's Church the divisions that have happened since the late 1800s and the last 50 years, the last 20 years. We're dividing churches over many of the same issues, just in a different flavor, that Paul is saying, don't don't divide the church over. It's not worth I've seen I've seen brothers destroy another brother. The reputation over something that, again, is a matter of opinion. You know, not to get personal in this particular area, but 
I drive past, depending on which way I come to church, I drive by as many as four churches of Christ. None of whom, to my knowledge, have much to do with each other. Yeah. yeah. They don't even really consider each other as brethren. Yeah. They don't consider us as their brethren. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've we've said enough. Yeah. Let's uh, stick a fork in it. It's done. Any any closing comments before we go, folks? Let's go to God first. <laughs> Father, I ask you tonight to be mindful of those that Jonathan mentioned at the beginning, those that are dealing with sickness, those that are dealing with grief, those that are dealing with natural disasters. Father, I pray that you would bless those in harm's way. Father, I thank you for this time together that you have given to us. And I pray, Father, that that what Jonathan and I have laid before the congregation and the class here has been accurate and true and according to your will and according to your way. Father, I pray that you continue to bless Jonathan and I as we study and as go even further here in this book. And Father, I pray that the lessons that we learn will just not be lessons that goes in our hearing, but will be applied to our actions. Father, I pray that you would give us a safe journey home and a good week ahead of us. I pray, Father, that you may put somebody in our pathway that is searching and looking for the truth with an open heart and give us just the right words to say, Father, to plant the seed. We ask you to forgive us of our sins to protect us from the evil one. When you call us home, we pray for a peaceful passing for all of us. We ask this in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen. Good night, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.